He passed through here one day. It was an ordinary day. The sun was high in the sky and it was hot. And I went to draw the day's water. I know, I know, that's a chore that's usually left for the early morning, for the cool of the day. But it was just easier for me to go when nobody else was there. And then I was able to avoid the wait in the line and, and the other women, the subtle humiliations of being gossiped about behind hands. Let's just say I wasn't popular with the local crowd. I went to the well that Jacob had given my ancestors so long ago, like I had a thousand times before. I took with me my big water jug and my dipper on a rope, for the well was deep. The place was deserted as I expected. I threw my dipper in, and suddenly I heard a voice. Give me a drink. I nearly jumped out of my skin. I thought I was alone. But then I looked harder and I saw the very top of his head over the top of the well wall. He was sitting in the shadows, leaning with his back against the cool stone. I composed myself. And then I thought, who is this man who's talking to an unaccompanied woman? He has no business doing that. I looked him over. He was obviously a Jew, and the Jews and the Samaritans have shared ancient ancestry way back. We Samaritans had the true religion, but the Jews, they had the Babylonian exile. We Samaritans preserved our Israelite ways, our scriptures, our holy places, but the Jews were changed by the Babylonian exile. And when they came back, they came back with subtly changed scriptures. And, and they say that the only place that God dwells is the temple in Jerusalem. But we have been worshiping God on our mountain since way back in the time of Joshua. We Samaritans didn't mix words or anything else with the Jews, and the Jews thought us ignorant and unclean. He spoke to me, so I decided to speak back to him. You know, I can break the rules. I'm pretty good at it, actually. Anyway, I said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask of me a drink of water? I'm a Samaritan. Now remember, by his religion, just by touching the cup, I would defile his Jewish sensibilities and make it unclean. I was curious about this one. I really wondered what he was about. I didn't have to wait long. He replied, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Who did he think he was? All high and mighty, breaking rules that everybody knows, crossing social boundaries, and now talking to me in riddles? I decided to put him in his place. I said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where are you going to get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who with his sons gave us this well and with their flocks drank from it? I was sure this would shut him up. I was uncomfortable. This was the most unusual encounter I had ever had. I was not at all prepared for what he said next. He replied calmly, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink from the water I give will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Right, never be thirsty again. The water he gives will spring up into eternal life. Yeah, we live in a desert. I called him on it. I told him, sir, Give me this water so that I will never be thirsty again or have to come to this well 
to draw water. Now he had to put up or shut up. Then he said, go call your husband and come back. He completely changed the subject, caught me completely off guard, and it was a sore subject with me. I told him, truthfully, I have no husband. He told me I was right in saying that I had no husband, but he didn't stop there. He went on to say, you have had five husbands and the one you're with right now is not your husband. How did he know this? I mean, it was common knowledge in the village, but for him to know this, a stranger was very strange. You know, I'd had five husbands. I'd lost them to the two Ds death and divorce. This is what made me the subject of all the gossip and the whispers. I had to admit that he was right. Just then I realized that this man must be a prophet from God, the real deal. I blurted out, sir, I see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to me, woman, believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He was saying that the place where you worship isn't important. And then he went on. You Samaritans don't really know who you worship. We Jews do know the God we worship and God will use us to save the world. He talked about a time that was coming that was actually already here where true worshipers were being led by the Spirit to worship the Father according to the truth. He said, these are the ones the Father is seeking to worship him. God is Spirit and those who worship God must be led by the Spirit to worship God according to the truth. He meant that it didn't matter where you worshiped. It only matters that you worship God according to the spirit of God and according to the truth. God was going to save the world. <laughs> Jesus was talking about the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who would bring God's reign to completion. I told him I knew the Messiah was coming, that God would send a savior. I said to him, when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And then he said the most remarkable thing to me. He said, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Jesus was saying that he was the Messiah, the chosen one sent to set us all free, free from the bondage of our own doing. I knew it was true. Only the Messiah would know me through and through. He was here to lead the way in breaking old boundaries between people, races, and genders, and all the different ways that we divide ourselves. This whole conversation shattered my expectations. It opened up the door to truth that we could share equally. I wasn't a Samaritan woman with a past. I was an individual in need of salvation, the salvation that only God can offer. And then his people came back and my jar was full. Our conversation ended as abruptly as it had started. But boy, was I different. I was different in that it was like a huge weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. Like I could breathe deeply for the first time in a long time. Jesus knew everything about me and still offered me living water. Well, I couldn't contain myself. I no longer hid out in the cool of the day. I went all over the city and I talked to all kinds of different people, telling them about Jesus, the Messiah, and what he had done for me. I told people everything I knew about him. And because of my testimony, many people came to believe in him. I told them that Jesus had told me everything I had ever done. And many people came to believe in Jesus because of my testimony. The people came and asked him to stay for a while. And he did. And we worshiped together in spirit and in truth. 
Many people came to believe in Jesus, the Messiah, because of his words and his example. And you know what they said? They said to me, we no longer believe because of what you said, but because we have seen with our own eyes and heard with our own ears that he truly must be the savior of the world. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The woman at the well is never named, yet her encounter with Jesus is the longest Jesus has with any other individual in the Gospel of John. She re represents the lowest of the low. She is a female in a society where women are both demeaned and disregarded. She is of a race traditionally despised by Jews. She is living in shame as a social outcast. This woman not only has a holy encounter with Christ, but also receives eternal salvation. Her personal testimony convinces an entire town to believe too. So what can we learn from this woman at the well? This story has significance. First, it shows Jesus' love for the whole world. The fact that the woman at the well was, such, was of such low standing, you know, gender, race, marital status, yet they talked so directly, almost as equal conversational partners. This shows Jesus has a heart for all people, not just some. We need to hear this story in the light of John 3, 16 and 17. In the previous chapter in John, Jesus has his encounter with Nicodemus, where Jesus says those most beloved words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This story of the woman at the well is showing Jesus practicing what he preached. Second, it reminds us that only Jesus can offer salvation. Jesus offers living water, eternal life. This is water that is not like regular water, but rather comes from God Almighty and lasts forever. Jesus is the living water that we need. When we put our faith and trust in him as the living water, we can bank on the fact that the well will never run dry. He will never tire of us. He will never turn us away. He is the unending source of peace joy, love, self-control, truth, hope, and satisfaction, the gifts of the Spirit. Abundant life can only be found in him. Jesus is the water that satisfies and sustains us. Jesus is the living spring given freely to us. Third, this story shows the importance of offering our testimony. When the woman believed, she immediately ran off to tell others. Her words made an impact. The scriptures tell us many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. We're called to tell our stories of healing, comfort, and salvation. Our joy should be like that of the woman's she couldn't wait to tell anyone who would listen about the saving grace given to her. In joy, we are to share the source of that joy. The fourth important message from this story is that it underscores Jesus as Messiah. He says he's the Messiah, and the woman and the townspeople believe him. As the Samaritans told the woman at the end of the story, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now 
we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. And finally, Jesus is not phased by our sin. The woman perceived Jesus as a prophet because he gently called out her sin. She tells others, he told me everything I ever did. Jesus is all-knowing and sees the sin within our hearts. He knows our deeds, desires, and our brokenness. And yet, and yet, he still pursues us and loves us just as he loved the woman. Jesus saw humanity's sin and was sent to shed his blood. He endured the cross for our sake, for our forgiveness. Our second reading from Paul emphasizes that. In saying, Paul writes, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died for the ungodly. The living water washes us clean of sin and renews our spirits. The woman at the well and all of us live in this hope. Her suffering like ours will move to hope through the living waters that Jesus is. As Paul wrote, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. If this worked for the woman at the well, it applies to us. Our suffering produces perseverance, character, and then hope when we belong to Jesus. The story of the woman at the well is a rich example of love, truth, redemption, and acceptance. And best of all, not only does Jesus accept her, he accepts you, me, us. This is the good news for today and every day. Amen. Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this witness of the woman at the well. Help us to remember that you seek us out, that you offer us living waters every time we come to you, every time we pray. Lord God, fill us, satisfy us, and lead us out that we may tell your story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>